Hey, who brought a Bible with them tonight? Anybody bring a Bible? How about a cell phone? Got a cell phone? Got a cell phone? How about some notes? You got some notes with you? Awesome. I got a, I got a cool, I think, a powerful word for you guys tonight. For, for, talking about represent. Who's been here every week? Anybody? 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 Who? Who? This is your first week. First week of the series. First week of the series. First week, second week, second week of the series. Maybe you got last week or the first week. Okay, so let's catch you up real quick. The first week we talked about represent what it looks like to live like Jesus, how to represent him, right? Then Pastor Adam talked about last week, what does it look like to actually live like Jesus? What does that look like? And then today I want to talk to you about why is it so hard? Has anybody ever thought it was hard? Anybody, anybody, anybody? Am I the only one? Hey, this is awesome, this Christian thing, this live out your faith thing, but why is it so hard? Why does every single time I think I've got it, I think I've got this thing down, something happens, I do something dumb, or man, something's going on, and then I just find myself going, I don't think I can do this. I don't think I can live this thing out. Has anybody else been there? I've been there so many times in my life, and I want to share some scripture with you. I've got two kind of long passages of scripture. Can you stick with me? Any, we got some readers in here. Anybody readers, 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 a couple of you? I'm not either, okay? I'm a slow reader, but read with me because it's very important. Are you ready? Have you heard me say yeah? All right, verse, verse, they're going to be on the screens. You can read with me. All right, verse 13, Matthew chapter 7 starts with verse 13. Jesus tells us why. He says, you can enter God's kingdom only through the narrow. Everybody say narrow. narrow. The narrow gate. The highway to hell is broad. The highway. You know that song? You know that? I can't get that. The highway to hell is broad and its gate is wide for many who choose that way. But the gateway to life is very what? Narrow. Come on, say it loud. One, two, three. Narrow. One more time. Narrow. The gateway to life is narrow and the road is, say that word. Narrow. Come on, say it with me. Narrow. Whoever, who wakes up in the morning and says, I want to do the hardest thing I can do today. Like, I want life to be so difficult. I want life to stink today. I want it to be so hard. None of us, none of us, none of us. You got a couple of liars in here. Raise your hand. None of us. That's what he says, though. He says it is difficult and only, everybody say the, what's the word after only? Only a uh, ever find it. That's pretty depressing, isn't it? Huh? The gateway to heaven, he says, the road to heaven is narrow. The road, the highway to hell is broad. It's difficult and only a few will ever find it. He goes on to say in verse 17, he goes on to say in verse 17, a good tree produces what? Good Come on, everybody. One, two, three. Good a good tree produces good fruit, and a bad tree produces bad. bad fruit. A good tree can't produce bad fruit, and a bad tree can't produce good fruit. So every tree that does not produce good fruit is chopped down and thrown into the fire. Yes, just as you can identify a tree by its fruit, you can identify people by their what? By their actions, verse 21, and then we'll move into the next verses. Now, er, not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those, and you want to underline this or you want to write this verse down and go back to it later. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. You guys get that? Only those who what? actually do the will of my Father will get into heaven. That means this. Everybody, lots of us have good intentions, right? We've got these great ideas of how we're going to live for God and how we're going to serve the Lord and all these things that we're going to do. We're going to, man, we're just going to do it. But a lot of times we get into this point where we go, I just can't, I can't live up to it. We've asked that question just a moment ago. But Jesus says, only those who actually do it. Actually do it. Now let's read the next passage of scripture. It's in Romans chapter 7. Everybody say 7. seven. Romans chapter 7. He goes on to say this in verse 15. It's the longest passage we'll read the rest of the night, I promise. Don't, I really don't understand myself, for I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Has anybody else been there? I want to do the right thing, but I don't do it. I do what I hate instead. But if I know that what I'm doing is wrong, it shows that I agree that the law is good. In other words, I know right from wrong. So I'm, uh, so I'm not the, what I, so I am not the one who is wrong. This shows that I agree with the law is good. So I am not the one doing wrong. It is the sin living in me that does it. 
And I know nothing good lives in me, that is, in my sinful nature. I want to do what is right, but I can't. I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. But if I do what I don't want to do, I'm not really the one doing it. It is the sin living in me that does it. And then he goes on to say, I have discovered this principle of life. Do you know what that means? It's a principle of life, meaning this. It applies to every one of us. It applies to you and to me and to your brother and to your mom, all of us. It applies to everybody. This principle of life that when I want to do what is right, inevitably I do what is wrong. I love God with all my heart. I love his law with all my heart. But there's another power at work within me that's at war with my mind. This power makes me a slave. Everybody say slave. slave. Makes me a slave to sin that's still within me. Oh, what a miserable person that I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? Thank God the answer is in who? Come on, one, two, three. Jesus Christ, our Lord. So you see how it is. In my mind, I really want to obey God's law, but because of my sinful nature, I am a slave to sin. Meaning this, why is it so hard? Why is it so hard to live for Jesus? Let me tell you the answer. You guys ready for the answer? Because it's impossible. It's impossible without Jesus. It's impossible. And let me tell you why it's been so hard for many of you. Many of you, it's so hard to consistently live for Jesus. It's because you're trying to do it in your own strength, and you really don't have a relationship with Jesus. It is difficult. Jesus said it's so hard to make it to this end. The, the road is narrow. The highway to hell is broad. And if you don't do it in a relationship with Jesus, you will never make it. The reason it's so hard is because it's impossible. And God knew it was impossible. And that's why he sent his son Jesus to die on a cross for your sins and for my sins so that we wouldn't have to be held accountable for those things if we accept him as our savior. Does that make sense? It's impossible. I'm going to pray real quick. And then I want to share with you three things. Three things from a passage of scripture. James chapter 4, verse 7 and 8. You want to write that down. Says this. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. I want to share with you those three principles tonight, those three ideas, and I want to talk about how in the world can we live this life that honors God if, if it's impossible. It ha always has to do with Jesus. So bow your heads, close your eyes, let's pray. God, we love you. Father, we're thankful for this night. God, we're thankful for your word. And Father, I thank you that tonight there's going to be some students that are set free from the power and the bondage of sin in their life. God, they've look, they wake up every day. They wake up every week. God, struggling with this life that they're living. God, they struggle at school and they struggle at home. They struggle in uh, relationships and friendships because they're doing it by themselves. Even though they're surrounded with friends, they're surrounded with people, they feel like they're all alone and nobody really cares. So tonight I pray, God, as we open up your word, God, that supernaturally, Holy Spirit, you would touch their hearts and they would realize it, we, it's impossible to do it on our own. We can't represent Jesus without Jesus living inside of us. So tonight, I pray that you would open our hearts and minds and that we would be receptive of your love and grace and mercy. In Jesus' name, amen. Number one, everybody say number one. All right, number one, if I'm going to do it, if it's possible, if it's so hard, if there's a way to get around it, God, you need to know this. I need to submit. I need to submit. He said this, if submit to God, it says, submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Did you know this, that, that it's not really submission if you want to do it? Do you guys know that? It's never submission if you're okay with it. In other words, like if, if mom says, go clean your room, and you love just cleaning your room, you're really not submitting to mom. You're just excited about what you get to do. You're agreeing with mom, right? It's never submission if you want to do it. It's only submission if you do it in spite of not wanting to do it. That's life. That's how life works. It's only submission if you do it in spite of not wanting to do it. And as a matter of fact, it always feels better on the front end to follow my emotions, and, uh, 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 but it's always short-lived. In other words, this, it always feels better on the front end to do what I want to do and not what I, I'm told to do. Does anybody else do that? Like you're told to do something and you don't want to do it. And up front, you want to say 
something back. Anybody ever said something back? Or you don't want to say, I'm not going to do that. Or you want to follow those emotions that well up when you disagree with something. And it always feels good on the front end to follow your emotions. But guess what the Bible says about our emotions? The Bible says in Jeremiah that our, our heart is deceitful above all things. Meaning this, that your emotions will lie to you every single time. And that's why the Bible tells us that we need to submit to God because up front, just like Paul said in Romans chapter 7, no matter how in my mind I want to do right, inevitably I always end up following my emotions. So you've heard people go, well, I... My heart's just telling me to do this. Has anybody ever heard that? I just feel like I need to do this. Or I just feel like, you've heard maybe girls say that about boys. My heart's just telling me that he's the right one. Or my heart's just telling me I need to do this. But your heart will always, what? Lie. Everybody say liar. Liar. Your heart will always lie. That's why the Bible says that in the midst of your emotions and in the midst of wanting to go one direction, we need to know what God's word says and submit to God's word and, 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 and push away our emotions. Submission feels like defeat, doesn't it? Because that's what culture tells us it is. Anybody ever like, you got like some MMA fighters in here? Some wrestling? Some wrestling. Submission in, in wrestling it means what? It means you give up, it means you're defeated. But the truth is, in God's universe, it always leads to victory. Submission in God's world always leads to a win. It never leads to a loss. As a matter of fact, following your emotions in God's world, like in this relationship with Jesus, following your emotions always leads to defeat. But if the Bible tells us to submit to God, then that means he's got a plan that's better, maybe something that he knows greater than we do. I've got a six-year-old. Anybody know Isabella, my daughter? Got some? Yeah, Isabella. I know a lot of times what's best for my daughter. When she was, when she was four... When she was four, she had this bright idea that she was going to run away from me in a parking lot. And there were cars going everywhere. And in her mind, she knew better. In her mind, she knew what she wanted, right? But in my mind, I knew what was coming. It was a car, and she was about to be floored. And there was going to be Isabella everywhere, all over the parking lot, right? But I knew better. I knew. I knew that I knew that she needed to stay with me. And it was going to take her doing what? Because she wanted something different. She was going to have to submit to my will, wasn't she? She was going to have to submit to what I told her to do because she wanted to run ahead of me. She wanted to beat me to the car. But had she run ahead and had she beat me to the car, chances are she would have lost her life. Why? Because she didn't see the car coming. And I can tell you this, guys, in your life, every single day, in your relationships, in your friendships at school, in your relationship with your parents, I can tell you that God sees the big picture every single time that you don't. And that's why the Bible tells us that sometimes we have to submit to God in order to see the true end, in order to see victory on the other end of it. That means you need to read his word. That means you need to know what God's word says. How can I submit to God if I don't have a clue what he's saying in my life? So many of us, we like to just, we like to just go through day to day and we just want to kind of live life. And we got this idea that we're a believer, but you have no clue what God's word says because you don't open your Bible unless you're here at church. So you don't know what God's word is, so you don't know what to submit to it. When's the last time I've opened my Bible just to hear from God? When's the last time you've opened your Bible and said, God, I don't know what it's, I really don't understand about this stuff, and I really don't have a, I'm not trained in hermeneutics and all those things. I don't really know the scientific words of the Bible and all this theology and stuff. But God, just, you're, they say at church that you, your word is alive and breathing. Just say something to me. Just open the Bible and say, God, what are you saying? How can God direct my steps if I don't read his word, how, do, how can I submit to what he's saying, all right? So the first thing is, if I'm going to honor God, it's hard. If I'm going to do that, i got to submit. The second thing, number two, is I have to resist. Everybody say resist. resist. Now, what's, what good does that, what sense does that make? i got to submit, and then i got to resist. The Bible says resist the devil, and he will what? What did it say? Flee. He'll run away. Resist the devil and he will flee. Listen to what 1 Peter 5 and 8 and 9 says this. Be alert. Everybody say alert. Be alert and be of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Now, has anyone ever seen National Geographic? You got some National Geographic fans? 
Maybe when you were a kid, it wasn't National Geographic. It was like Saturday morning uh, ABC. They would show like the safari or whatever. Have you guys ever seen lions hunt? Anybody ever seen it? What do lions do? How do they hunt? They do what now? Say it louder. They sneak. Everybody say sneak. sneak. They sneak up on you. A lion sneaks up on you. Now, why did the Bible just tell us in 1 Peter that our enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion? Now, I, I'm no, I don't want to portray myself as like a scientific expert or anything, but I know a little bit, okay? Let me tell you why. Who does all the hunting with the lion in the lions? The what? The female. The ladies do all the hunting. So they know how to hunt. They know how to sneak up on somebody, and they know how to, they know how to get the prey, and they bring it back to the cubs. They bring it back to the family. Now, guess what happens when the, when the, when the meal gets brought back to the family? Who's with the family? The man, right? The male lion. And you know what he does when the food gets there? He likes to what? He likes to roar, doesn't he? He likes to roar. You know why he likes to roar? Because he wants to scare everything off that's there. Now, why does the Bible says, be alert, be on guard, because your enemy prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour? Meaning this, if the enemy is roaring around you, you've already been defeated. If the enemy is roaring around you and you can feel it and you know it's there, he's looking for someone to devour. Nothing's there for the, enemy, for the, for the male lion to devour unless it's already been killed by the, people that, by, the, by the women that were out hunting. They go get the prey. They bring it in. It's already dead, okay? He's roaring around because it's already defeated. Listen to what it says. Resist. Everybody say resist. Resist, resist him standing firm in the faith. Because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. Now, I want to talk about that word resist. There's a Greek, there's a, uh, there's a better meaning about it. When, it. when we think resist, we think push away or we think fight back. That's kind of what we think. Listen to what it means. It's, the Greek word means to oppose, to resist, and I love this, to stand out against. It means to stand out against. In other words, Pastor Adam talked about last week living out loud. It talked about standing out and loud and proud for the faith that Jesus has placed inside of you. The best way that we can resist the enemy is to represent Jesus standing out, meaning this, you'll never impact your your school. You'll never impact your friends. You'll never impact people around you living undercover. You'll never do it. If you look like everybody at school and you talk like everybody at school and you hang around the same people and you say the same jokes and do the same things and gossip the same way and everything looks the same and acts the same, guess what? You're the same. You're not different. You're not living for Jesus. You're not resisting the enemy in your life. I want to give you three ways to resist. Are you ready? Everybody say number one. Everybody say the way I talk. The way I talk, and am I encouraging others? You know, the Bible says in Colossians, it said, let no unwholesome talk come out of your mouth as a believer. In other words, unless it can encourage people, unless it can encourage people, the Bible says, keep your mouth shut. Don't talk. Unless it's an encouraging word to others, don't say it. If you can't say something nice, what did Bambi's mama say? Don't say something at all. It was Thumper's mama. It wasn't even Bambi's mama. So don't say anything at all. If you can't say something good, the Bible, that was a biblical principle. You didn't even know. It's a, it's a biblical principle. Only encourage others. Survey your day just today. Let's survey our day. How many times did you have an opportunity to cut somebody down or to say something dis disheartening to someone or to hurt someone? Maybe it was to your brother or to your sister. You go, well, that don't even count. That's my brother. It counts. How many times to your family, to your mom, your parents, your guardian, how many times have you had an opportunity to cut them down, but you know that you should have submitted to God's word, right? Submit to God, resist the enemy. What am I resisting? I'm living out loud. I'm going to be tangibly different the culture around me. The way I talk makes a difference. Everybody say, the company I keep. Oh, that was poor. The company, the company I keep. The company I keep. Listen to what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15, 33. Don't be misled. Everybody read it with me. Read it on the screen. Bad company corrupts good character. If you never, ever, ever 
memorize a verse. You need to memorize this one. Write it down. Go home tonight. Remember it. Don't be misled. Don't be deceived. Bad company corrupts good character. You need to take a survey right now of the people that you're hanging around. Who are your friends? Who's your boyfriend? Who's your girlfriend? Who's your, who's your, who's, who are you hanging around in your neighborhood? Who do you hang around at school? Are those relationships character, God-honoring relationships? Do those people have integrity? Do those people have care? Are they chasing God as hard as you say you want to chase God? Bad company corrupts good character. You need to surround yourself with people who have the same goal as you have in your life. If you want to honor God, if you want to represent Jesus, you got to represent him out loud. You have to resist the enemy in your life. And then the last one I'll give you, how do I resist? The decisions. Everybody say decisions. Decisions I make. The decisions I make make a difference. Every choice I make has a ripple effect to everybody around me. The, the choices you make with your friends, the choices you make at school, they all make a difference. You, if you're going to resist the enemy, you're going to need people to do it with you. So you need, to, you need to circle yourself with people who love God and make decisions that honor God. Stand out and live different. And then the last thing I'll give you tonight, number three, what's the third thing I can do? Is I have to pursue. I have to pursue. James 4, 8, the last part of that verse says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. So here's my question. Here's my question for you, students. How, if I'm just surveying my week, let's not even say my, my whole life right now. If I'm surveying my week, have I really submitted to God's word how can I say I've resisted the enemy in my life? What does that look like? What are the things I'm saying? What's the company that I'm keeping? What's the decisions that I'm making? Listen, you don't need somebody. You don't always just need someone. Listen, if you can just see God's word. Are the people that I'm hanging around, are they honoring God with their life right now? Are they, are they chasing God like you're chasing God? Are you even chasing God? Or even pursuing relationship with Jesus? Some of you say, yeah, Brandon, I'm, I'm pursuing relationship with Jesus. I'm a youth group every Wednesday. Man, I don't miss church. I'm at church every Sunday. But what does your life look like between Wednesday and Sunday? What's your relationship like with Jesus? Not the front you're putting on so people think you might be a believer. Not that, not that act you're putting on. The only thing that's fooling are people around you. That'll never fool Jesus. That's why Jesus said, the road is what? Narrow. It's narrow. Only those who actually do the will of the Father. Only those who actually do it. Not those who say they do it and put on a good front and wear cool Christian t-shirts and, 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 and church logos and, and act like that. And, and you know, I, I get to do things with church. and That's awesome. That's cool. But what's are only those who actually do the will of the Father. So what does it look like to pursue Jesus? What does it look like to pursue Him? Because the Bible says, draw near to God and He will draw near to you. You need to know this. God will always be as close to you as you're willing to be with Him. He will always be as close to you as you're willing to be with Him. God is moved by your movement. If you take a step to Him, guess what He does? Every single time, without question. If I'm going to take a step to God, He's always going to take a step to you. Pursuing God. Every head bowed and every eye closed. You're here tonight and you will be honest with yourself. You're here tonight and you're going to be honest with yourself. You say, man, I really don't, I, I can't tell you the last time I've submitted to anything godly. The truth is, I have chased my emotions lately more than I ever have. It's just felt right, so I've done it. It's just made me feel good, so that's the, that's the direction that I went. I didn't really even stop to think, God, what do you think about this? What's your word say about this? Guys, I'm going to tell you, representing Jesus is hard. You can never do it apart from Him. And you're going to have to give your life to Him to make that count. So, 
you're here tonight and you say, I need a relationship with Jesus. I need to be authentic in, in what I'm saying. The truth is, I can't tell you the last time I've pursued him. I can't tell you the last time I've thought about a relationship with him. And I need to know that I know tonight that that's a real relationship. I need to trust Jesus with my life. Nobody's looking. Nobody's looking around. If that's you, just put your hand up. I'm going to lead you in a prayer today. Come on, I see your hands. That's good. Come on, you be brave tonight and say, man, I haven't pursued Jesus. I've pursued my emotions. I've pursued my own desires. I've done it myself. Truth is, I thought I was on this narrow gate, this narrow road to heaven. But honestly, I'm probably closer to this broad highway that the Bible says leads to hell. I need a real relationship with Jesus. Here's what I'm going to do. We've got some time left. I left some intentional time on my preaching clock tonight. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. Matt's going to sing a song. And I want you to take a moment right where you are, right where we are tonight. Find a place by yourself alone. You can stay in your seat, but just psychologically get alone with Jesus. And I want you to pursue him. Pursue him in your prayer. Pursue him in your worship. Chase after him and his will. It's as simple as taking a step to him. Draw near to God and he'll draw near to you. He's always as close as you're willing to be with him. So Father, today, tonight I pray, God, in this moment, God, as students are reverent where they are, God, I pray that you would touch their hearts. God, the decisions that they're making, God, let them know if it honors you or not. God, the relationships that they're around, the company that they're keeping, God, let them know some decisions that they need to make tonight that are going to take a step to you or a step away from you. God, you're as close as we're willing to be with you. And tonight I'm praying that there's some students that want to get close to you, closer than they've ever been. So Jesus, as, as, as we pursue you, I, I pray, God, that you would forgive us of our sins. We've tried to do this on our own. And your word tells us that if we would just confess them to you, God, that you are willing and just and you would forgive us from all unrighteousness. So, Father, I pray, God, those students who said, I need Jesus, I need a relationship with him. Jesus is what you died on the cross for. God, you're standing willing and open, waiting for relationship with him. So, Father, in Jesus' name, God, we just confess our sins to you. And Jesus, we pick up your salvation and we commit to live a life on purpose for you. We celebrate life change. And in these next four minutes, we pursue you, God, maybe like we never have before. We trust you with our lives and we honor you tonight. Thank you for salvation in Jesus' name.